Have you had the opportunity to deploy IPv6 yet? Have you had the opportunity to study IPv6 yet? The answer to that is no. Don't worry, you will. <laughs> IPv6 is now officially a protocol that we all must consider deploying worldwide. The reason why is because IPv4 is quickly becoming obsolete because we've run out of IPv4 addresses. We have. IANA has no more to hand out. The majority of regional registries are down to their last few IPv4 addresses. So IPv6 is the future going forward. What that means is we need routing protocols that can support IPv6. So if you plan on deploying IPv6 and you're using OSPF, you will be looking at OSPF v3. OSPF v3, version 3. This simply means it's for IPv6. That's what it means. OSPF v2 is for IPv4. So OSPF v3 is for IPv6. OSPF v2 is for IPv4. These are completely different routing processes. They do not talk to each other. They do not intermingle with each other, meaning that you can run them both at the exact same time on your router, which is great because you already have IPv4 deployed in your network. Now you want to implement IPv6. So what do you do? Well, it's as simple as deploying IPv6 in the network, deploying OSPF v3, and you don't have to worry about that affecting your OSPF v2 routing domain. Now, what do we have to learn about OSPF v3? Not a whole lot. Why? Because we already know about it from OSPF v2. If you are familiar with OSPF v2 for IPv4, well, we're still dealing with multi-area network designs. Could you deploy a single OSPF area? Yeah, go ahead. Are you going to benefit from any features or services to scale and grow and multiply your OSPF routing domain? No, not if you have a single area, not at all. But if you deploy your multi-area design, just like you would for IPv4, OSPF v2, well, then you can take advantage of all those features. So you're going to have area border routers. You're going to have autonomous system boundary routers. So in this case, who are the area border routers? R2 and R3, exactly. R2 and R3 would be the area border routers. Who would be an autonomous system boundary router? R4. So it doesn't matter whether it's OSPF v2 or OSPF v3. The design can be the exact same. We're just overlaying our v3 now on what we've already done for v2. So if you already have a v2 deployment, you can keep that deployment and just reuse everything you've done and just configure it for v3 as well. And this will allow us to take advantage of all the optimizations that come along with the multi-area deployment from a shortest path first algorithm standpoint. So some of the characteristics though that we need to know for OSPF v3 is that we still need a router ID. We still need a router ID. Just like we have for OSPF v2. Now, with OSPF v2, we have a 32-bit address. Are we going to use an IPv6 address as our router ID for OSPF v3? No, no. We're still going to use a 32-bit number. Still going to use a 32-bit number. Thank goodness, because I would hate to analyze the router ID of a router based on a 128-bit IPv6 address. So we still are dealing with a 32-bit number. So our router ID for OSPF v3 is going to look like, feel like, taste like, smell like an IPv4 address. It's a 32-bit number in dotted decimal notation. How is it determined? It's determined the same way we determined it for OSPF v2. So let me remind you what that is. You can configure it manually. And if you configure it manually, the router will use the manual configuration. And that is the recommended best practice for stability sakes. Because if you don't manually specify the router ID, then the router is going to identify any loopback interfaces with IPv4 addresses. If it finds any active loopback interfaces with IPv4 addresses, it finds the highest IP address amongst those loopback interfaces and uses it as the router ID. What if it doesn't find any loopback interfaces with IPv4 addresses? Then it analyzes the physical interfaces with IPv4 addresses and does what? Picks the highest IP address amongst those active physical interfaces. 
and uses that as the router ID. But let's say you have a router that you're deploying OSPF v3 on, and there is no IPv4 address at all on that router. Then what happens? The router will ask you to manually configure the router ID. So you need a router ID. You need a router ID. It's going to be a 32-bit number. Manual configuration is the best because then you're not susceptible to all the issues that you could run into with physical interfaces or loopback interfaces. Essentially, the accidental change of the router ID during a router reboot or during a flapping interface or whatever issue you run into. Stability is the key to the router ID because you have to remember when we share LSAs, when we exchange information, when we form neighborships, that's all based on our router IDs identifying our routers uniquely within that OSPF routing domain. So it has to be unique, has to be unique. Adjacencies, next top IP addresses using the link local address. So for example, a link local address would start off with FE80, if you're not familiar with that, FE80 typically. So we don't even need a global address to form neighbor adjacencies. We don't even need a global address for the next top IP address because everything's gonna be based on the link local address. So when I learn about a global network, a global IPv6 network, the next top IP address is gonna be the link local address of the next router that's gonna get me to that particular destination network. IPv6 is gonna be used for transporting all the LSAs. We enable OSPF v3 on a link by link basis, meaning that there is no network command. There is no network command at all. So you go to the individual interfaces and you say, you are participating in the routing process. And we are gonna be utilizing multicast addresses and unicast addresses for communication. So in this case, what is the multicast address gonna be for our hello packets by default? What is it, do you know? Do you know what it is? Let me show you what it is. So we have F, F, zero, two, double colon, five. What is it for IPv4? It's two, two, four, zero, zero, five. In this case, it's F, F, zero, two, double colon, five. If you're not familiar with what F, F, zero, two means, FF02 is referring to link local multicast addresses. That's right. So if you ever see a multicast address that starts with FF02, it means it's a link local multicast address. What that implies is that when a, 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 a multicast packet is being sent out of, a, of an interface and the destination is FF02, it will never be forwarded off of that link off of that local area network. It will stay amongst that local area network, meaning a router will never route an FF02 multicast packet. But the five is the same thing as IPv4. IPv4 was 224.005. Well, in this case, we have FF02 double colon five. So that's for the hello packet. Now, one additional piece of information is that we have another multicast address for the DR and BDR. Do you remember? What we used for IPv4, OSPF v2, when we wanted to talk to the designated router. Do you remember what that multicast address was? 224006. Well, in this case, we would have FF02 double colon six as the multicast address in multi access networks when we want to talk directly to the designated router and backup designated router. So the majority of our OSPF v3 deployments are gonna be the exact same as OSPF v2 with some of these minor modifications that we've talked about so far. Let's set up OSPF v3 in our topology. So all the addressing has been done for us already. You can see the addresses that are applied to all the different interfaces on our routers. And what we're going to do now is set up OSPF v3 on our gig 00 and 10 interfaces of our 1, R2, and R3. We'll also set it up on the fast Ethernet and serial interfaces of R3 and R4, and in the gig 10 interface of R4. So we're not going to enable OSPF v3 on 30 of R2 or R3. So let's get started here. We're going to type in configure terminal IPv6 router. 
OSPF, and then we have to give it the process ID. If you pick the same process ID that you used for IPv4, is that going to be a problem? Is that going to be a problem? No. Now, these are two completely separate routing processes. That's what they are. So as a result of that, if you have OSPF process ID 1 for IPv6 and OSPF process ID 1 for IPv4, they don't talk to each other. They don't care about each other. They don't conflict with each other. So if you pick the same process ID number, fine, it's going to work. But I highly encourage you not to. And the reason why is because as you look at output and you see OSPF process 1, well, then you're going to have to double check to see if that information is for IPv4 or IPv6. So you might run into some confusing scenarios just as an administrator where you're looking at output and you make a decision and you realize, oh, my gosh, that was for IPv4 and not IPv6. So just keep your numbers different. Keep your numbers different when it comes to the process ID. So I'm going to go ahead and type in OSPF process ID 5 here because we use process ID 1 for IPv4. Now, look what it says. IPv6 routing is not enabled. This is extremely important because in order to set up your OSPF routing for IPv6, you're going to have to enable IPv6 unicast routing. So that's the very first command you actually have to do. So IPv6 unicast routing. It's really nice that the router warns us about that. It'll tell us, hey, look, it's not going to work if you don't turn it on. So you have to turn it on or else I'm not even going to let you configure OSPF v3. So always make sure you turn IPv6 unicast routing on with that command. Now we'll type in IPv6 router OSPF5, and you'll see that we're in router OSPF configuration mode. What are we going to do next? Well, really, at this point, we really we don't have to do nothing under this router configuration mode. You might want to set a router ID, but we'll come back and talk about the router ID in another video. So at this point in time, I just want to set up my interfaces. So do we use the network command to do that? Well, network, and the answer to that is no. There is no network command for OSPF v3. What we have to do is we have to go to the interfaces and enable the routing process on those interfaces. So let's do that right now. We're going to type in interface gigabit ethernet 0 slash 0 IPv6 OSPF process ID 5 and what area do we belong to? It's as simple as that. So 0, 0 belongs to area 0. And then we go to interface gigabit ethernet 1 slash 0 and we're going to type in the same command. So I just enabled the routing process on those two interfaces. No network command. It's the IPv6 OSPF area command that we use for OSPF v3. So let's go over to R2 and do the exact same thing. So configure terminal, IPv6 router OSPF. Now, does the process ID have to match here? Yes or no? Does the process ID have to match with R1 in order to form a neighbor adjacency? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. If you said yes, you might be thinking about EIGRP. Well, with OSPF, no the process ID does not have to match between devices to form neighborships. However, I highly encourage that you make it match. Why is that? Well, if you make it match, then you know that OSPF process ID 5 here relates to OSPF process ID 5 on R1. Right? We're, all, we're all part of the same routing domain. At that, right? It just helps you out as administrators. Keep everything straight when you're looking at output, when you're looking at documentation. Right? Keep it straight by having a consistent process ID, even though it doesn't have to be. So I'm going to go ahead and put five here as well. Again, IPv6 unit cache routing is not enabled. So let's make sure we do that. And then we'll say IPv6 router OSPF5. Now, interface, gigabit Ethernet 1 slash 0, IPv6 OSPF, process ID 5, area 0. And then we'll do the same thing for gig 0, 0. Notice we formed a neighborship with R1. All right, so we formed a neighborship with R1, router ID 192.168.255.1. Let's go over to R3 and do the same thing. So configure terminal, IPv6 unicast routing, IPv6 router OSPF5. Then we'll say interface gigabit ethernet 1 slash 0, IPv6 OSPF5 area 0. All right, so we should see a neighborship formed with R1 and R2, and we do. It's right there. Perfect. Okay, so what's next now? We have to enable IPv6 OSPF, so OSPF v3 on fast Ethernet 00, 00 and 0, 02 slash 1. But be careful here. here. Here's where you have to realize that's a different area. I better put the correct command in on those interfaces. So what I'm going to do in this case is type in IPv6. Go to interface configuration mode first, fast Ethernet 0 slash 0. IPv6 OSPF5 area 51. 
Remember, area these have to match in order to form neighbor adjacency. So when I configure R4, it's all in area 51. That means these interfaces better be in area 51 as well. Interface serial 2 slash 1, same command right there. All right, lastly, we'll go over to R4. Configure terminal. IPv6 unicast routing. I want to try something here. Let's type in interface fast ethernet 0 slash 0. If I type in IPv6 OSPF 5 and say area 51, will it automatically create OSPF process 5 for me? Okay, it accepted the command. But will it automatically create the OSPF process for me? Hmm. I don't see anything yet. So let's type in interface serial 2 slash 1. Do the same thing there. And then we'll type in interface gigabit ethernet 1 slash 0. And do that there. Look at that. We formed a neighbor adjacency across the serial interface. We did. I haven't seen anything yet for fast ethernet 0 slash 0. Haven't seen anything yet. But you know what? Let's take a look at the running config right now. Do show run pipe to section router OSPF. Wow, there's the one on OSPF 00. Or sorry, there's the one on fast ethernet 0 slash 0. Try to type in OSPF and say fast ethernet at the same time. Look at that. It created it for me automatically. So with OSPF v3, if you go to the interface and you type in IPv6 OSPF 5, and you place interfaces in an area, it'll automatically create the OSPF process for you and start it and start it. So I didn't even have to type in IPv6 router or OSPF5. It did it for me automatically. Very, very, very impressive. All right. So right now, let's just verify here. Show IP route. Do we know about 12 double colon? Well, let's look at the right routing table. Show IPv6 route. Do I know about 12 double colon and I do? 12 double colon is listed right here that we can see. So there's 12 double colon. Sorry, that's the wrong one. 12 double colon, where are you? There you are, right there. That's what I was looking for. All right, so we've learned about that. We've learned about it from our three. So I'm pretty happy with the topology so far. I'm pretty happy with my configuration. And let's go over to R1, do the same thing there. Show IPv6 route. Do we know about four double colon? Do we know about four double colon? And we do right there. So just based on a quick glance at the routing table, it looks like we've set up OSPF v3 properly. We've enabled the process on the correct routing interfaces, and we're learning those IPv6 routes. This is the routing table on R1. I want you to analyze this routing table on R1, and I want you to identify if there is a way for us to get to the internet. Well, I see four double colon, that's off of R4. I see 12 double colon, that's local. I see 34 double colon, that's between R3 and R4. 43 double colon, that's between R3 and R4. I see one, two, three double colon, that is between R1, R2, and R3. I don't see any option that allows me to reach anything outside of our OSPF routing domain. And how would I be able to identify that? Well, if we look at the codes in our routing table, we would definitely see OE1 or OE2 codes for external routes. Right now, all I have is internal routes, and those internal routes are to destinations outside of my area right now, according to R1. So with that in mind, how can we reach the internet? Well, we could create a static default route on R1. On R1, we could type in IPv6 route, double colon, slash zero, with a next hop IP address of the link local address of R2's gig10 interface, or the global address of gig10's interface on R2. But the problem with the static default route is that it's static. There's no way for it to be adjusted on the fly. There's no way uh, for our routers to change paths or choose a more optimal path if something happens in the organization. So what would be better is to have that router that is connected to the internet, connected to the exit point out of our organization, advertise a default route instead. So essentially, we could set up a static default route on R2 and tell R2, hey, tell everybody else that you are the exit point. 
that you have the ability to reach all those other networks. And then as a result, if something happens internally in our organization, the way that default route is advertised could be adjusted, changed, modified on the fly without any administrative intervention. And then alternative paths could be determined in order to get to the internet. So it's better to have it advertised through the OSPF v3 process, this default route, instead of you manually adding this default route to all the devices, because then if anything changes, you'll have to ma manually adjust them as well. So let's go over to R2 and see if we have a static default route. So show IPv6 route. We do have a static default route. So let's take a look at the running config. So show run pipe to include IPv6 route. Let's see. Well, that's not how you spell route. Let's see what it looks like. We can see here that it's the IPv6 route command, double colon, slash zero, out fast ethernet three slash zero, going to the next top address of 2001 DB802 double colon one, so the ISP's address. So now let's issue the command on R2 that will take this static default route and inject it into the OSPF database. If we look at the show IPv6 OSPF database right now, we'll see that there is no default route listed in this OSPF database. There's no default route listed here. So the goal is to get that default route into the database. So configure terminal IPv6 router OSPF 5. This is process ID 5, if I recall correctly. Yes, process ID 5, it says right here. All right, so let's go ahead and now issue the default information originate command. So this command tells the router, grab that static default route that's in my routing table right now and import it into the OSPF database. So if we look at our OSPF database, now we go right down to the bottom, we'll see that we have that static default route listed at the bottom, double colon slash zero, and we are advertising it. Two, uh, 203.0.113.2, that's R2's router ID. So what we need to do now is just double check to see, does R1 know about it now? So we look at show IPv6 route and it does. It's that external route we can see here with the next top IP address of R2's link local address. R2's link local address on its gig one size zero interface. Go over to R3, do the same thing. Show IPv6 route. We'll see that R3 also has one as well. If we go over to R4, we'll type in show IPv6 route. It has it as well. So just by going to the router that has the static default route and typing in default information originate allowed us to take the static default route, inject it into the OSPF routing process, and then advertise it to all the other routers. Let's analyze hello packets. We're going to use the command debug IPv6 OSPF hello. And I want to see here exactly what interfaces on R4 we're sending and receiving hello packets on. So I'm going to go ahead now and shut off this debug because we pretty much have the information that we need. So as of right now, we are sending, sending hellos on 2 slash 1. Do we want to send hellos out 2 slash 1? Yes, we do. Because we need to form a, a neighbor adjacency with R3. We are. Sending hellos out fast ethernet zero slash zero. Do we want to send hellos out fast ethernet zero slash zero on R4? Yes, we do. Because we want to form a neighbor adjacency with R3. We are sending hellos out gig one slash zero. Do we want to send hellos out gig one slash zero? Do we? Well, let's get the topology. R4. Gig one slash zero. Where does that go? That goes down to switches. Goes down to end stations. Goes down to phones, PCs, laptops, wireless access points. Do any of those devices need to form a neighbor adjacency with R4? No. No. So why waste the bandwidth? Why waste the bandwidth? <laughs> and I'm laughing. Because... <laughs> These aren't very big, these packets, these hello packets. They're small. So I'm not really concerned about bandwidth here. I could keep sending hello packets out gig one slash zero, and the bandwidth consumption really doesn't bother me. And it shouldn't bother you either, especially on a gigabit Ethernet interface and a gigabit Ethernet network. 
However, however, let me paint this other picture for you now off of R4. Let's say a rogue router is introduced to the local area network off of a gig one slash zero. A rogue router, that's right. A router that you don't intend to have in that part of your network. What happens if that router interface is enabled for OSPF v3? What happens if it starts sending hello packets? Is R4 going to receive the hello packets? Yes. And R4's hello packet that it's sending out a gig one slash zero will be received by that rogue router, which means they're going to form a neighbor adjacency, aren't they? Yeah, they are. All right. So if they form a neighbor adjacency, are they going to share routing information? Yes. Does that mean the rogue router could send R4 bogus, inaccurate routing information? Yeah. Could that mean that all traffic or some traffic could be rerouted to the bogus router so it can be captured and then that router just sends it back on its merry way to the, let's say, internet or wherever it has, wherever it, wherever else it has to go, like the data center? You bet. That sounds to me like a security issue now more than anything. So for me, I would like to suppress the sending of the hello packets out gig one zero. And as a result of suppressing that, we're also going to be suppressing the receiving of hello packets on that interface as well. So R4 will no longer accept hello packets on gig one zero or send hello packets on gig one zero, essentially improving the security of that part of our organization. So you might say, well, Raymond, why just suppress the sending and receiving of hello packets? Why not just not allow that interface to participate in the routing process? Well, if I don't allow gig one slash zero to participate in the routing process, what's going to happen? Let me show you this. Let me show you this. So right now, if I type in show run interface gigabit one slash zero, you'll see here that we have the IPv6 OSP of five area 51 command. That is enabling this interface to participate in the routing process. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this off. But before I do that, let's look at R1 right now and type in show IPv6 route. So we have that network right here. Four double colon slash 64. That belongs to gig one slash zero. So let's now remove this command. And we'll go back to R1. Give it a chance to converge. Well, there you go. Do you see four double colon there anymore? I don't. It's not listed there in the routing table of R1. So I've suppressed the sending and receiving a hello packets on gig one zero by disabling it from participating in the routing process. Okay, well, now we can't even reach that network. So that's not going to work. It's not going to work for us at all. So if we go back to R4 and let's issue the command IPv6. OSPF5, Area 51, the result of that is enabling it to participate in the routing process. And as a result, it will get advertised. And we can see now that R1 knows about it. So I still want the interface's network to be advertised to all the other routers. But I want to suppress those hello packets. So we have a command called the passive interface feature. So we'll type in IPv6 router... OSPF, process ID 5. And now in router OSPF configuration mode, we're going to say passive interface. I like saying passive interface default. What that means is every single interface will stop sending and receiving hello packets, but they're still participating in the routing process. So that those routes will still be advertised with neighbors. The problem with this, though, now is that we've lost our neighborship with R3, so R4 can't advertise anything to R3 without a neighborship. So now what we're going to say is no passive interface fast ethernet zero slash zero and no passive interface serial two slash one. So now both of those interfaces will still send and receive hello packets because I removed the passive interface feature from them with the no version of the command and gig one zero will no longer be sending and receiving hello packets because it is still passive. The great thing about this passive interface default command is that since every interface is passive now, if we accidentally have an interface enabled for OSPF that we didn't intend to have enabled for OSPF, it will not send hello packets. That's right. So even though it's enabled for OSPF, it falls underneath passive interface default now. So we 
will not send or receive hello packets at the interface. So go to fast ethernet zero slash three as an example. If that interface accidentally gets enabled for OSPF v3, is it gonna send hello packets? No, no, not at all. Not unless somebody types in no passive interface fast ethernet three slash zero. So that even enhances your security a little bit more by making sure every interface is passive unless explicitly told not to be passive. So how can we verify passive interfaces show IPv6 protocols? Does it tell us what interfaces are passive? No, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. Wow, that's right. Doesn't tell us what interfaces are passive in this output on R4. So is there another command that we might be able to use? Can we take a look at OSPF specifically? Show IPv6 OSPF. Wow, how do we verify passive interfaces now with OSPF for IPv6 since show IPv6 protocols doesn't tell us? Well, what we can do is we can type in show IPv6 interface and we'll say gigabit one slash zero as an example. Show IPv6 OSPF interface. And when we look at this output, you'll see it says here passive interface. So we'll have to go to the output of show IPv6 OSPF interface and then that specific interface to verify if it's passive or not. If we go and look at the output of fast ethernet zero slash zero, we'll see here that it does not say anything about that. It just says simply our hello is gonna be due in six seconds in this case. Whereas on the passive interface, it says there's no hellos because we're a passive interface. Let's look at some general OSPF v3 verification commands. First one, show IPv6 protocol. So this is not directly related to OSPF v3, but it definitely allows you to verify which IPv6 routing protocols are running currently on your router. In this case, we only have OSPF. And it says OSPF process ID of five. There's our router ID. It indicates that we're an area border router. So if we're an autonomous system boundary router, it should indicate that as well. Show IPv6 protocols. We'll see here that on our two, it says we're an autonomous system boundary router. We are advertising networks that are outside of our OSPF routing domain. Go back over to R3. We'll also see it tells us the number of areas that we belong to. Since this is an area border router, we belong to two different areas. Uh, but in this case, they're both normal areas. We haven't turned them into stub areas or not so stubby areas. We can see the interfaces that are participating in each of the areas. So it's very, very precise output here. Interface gig one zero is in area zero. Interfaces serial two one and fast ethernet zero zero are in area 51. And then redistribution is none right now. But if you had redistribution set, it would be listed there. Wow, that's it. That's right. There's a big difference in the output of show IPv6 protocols when compared to show IP protocols for IPv4. It's a lot... Uh, <laughs> it's a lot less information there. It's very, very lightweight. And you can't even really verify passive interfaces in this output either. With IPv4, we would verify passive interfaces. But if we go over to R4, we have passive interface right now, show IPv6 protocols. Gig10 is passive. It doesn't say that here. So we can't even verify passive interfaces in this output. You'd have to look at the specific interface itself that's passive with show IPv6 OSPF interface, gigabit10, to see that it happens to be a passive interface. So a lot of difference there with show IPv6 protocols. So make sure you know those differences with IPv6 versus IPv4. Now show IPv6 OSPF is going to allow us to verify general parameters related to the OSPF v3 routing process. So in this case, we're running OSPF v3. It's process ID 5, and there's our router ID. We can see that we're an area border router. If we were in a ton of system boundary router like R2 is, it would say that at this point in time. Then we see information regarding shortest path first algorithm, statistics, timers that go along with it. But what I really like is the reference bandwidth command is listed here or parameter is listed here. So remember that the reference bandwidth is used for the cost calculation. So you have your reference bandwidth, which is gonna be 100 megabits per second by default on this particular router running this version of the operating system of 15.2, if I recall correctly. So we have 100 megabits per second divided by the interface bandwidth to give us the cost of the interface. Then down below, we'll be able to see the different areas that this device belongs to. So the output of show IPv6 protocol said that we had um, two areas on this particular router and we saw what interfaces were within what area in that output. So when I look here, it says we have 
connectivity to the backbone area, area zero. And there is only one interface that's connected to the backbone area. And then area 51, which is just a normal area, has two interfaces that are participating in it. Now, if, if we had authentication set up for our area, we'd see that information listed here. If we had a route summarization set up for an area, we'd see that information here. If we had not so stubby areas and totally not so stubby areas and stub areas and totally stub areas, that information would show up here as well. If you wanna take a quick mental snapshot of the interfaces participating in the OSPF v3 routing process, you can use the command show IPv6 OSPF interface brief. So this output is going to give us just a quick snapshot as to the interfaces that are participating in the routing process. So we can see here gig one zero, serial two one, and fast ethernet zero size zero are all participating in the routing process. And this specific process happens to be process ID number five. If we analyze the area number here, we'll see that gig one zero belongs to area zero and the other two interfaces belong to area 51. We have with OSPF v3 or IPv6, pardon me, with IPv6, our interfaces are represented with interface ID numbers. And you can see here that locally on our device that gig one zero is represented as interface ID number four. With serial, it's represented as interface ID number six. And with fast ethernet zero slash zero, it's represented with interface ID number three. This is not an OSPF specific interface identification number. This is an IPv6 specific identification number. And the reason why is that on our routers, on our PCs, on any device that has the ability to speak IPv6, as its protocol, well, it can have multiple addresses associated with a single interface. It can have the same link local address associated with multiple interfaces, that's right. As a result of that, we use these interface identifiers instead of the actual addresses to represent these device, uh, to represent these interfaces. So whereas IPv4, you'd see the IP address of the interface listed there. In this case with IPv6, because you could have multiple IPv6 addresses on an interface, you're gonna see the interface ID instead. The same thing is true with your PCs. They're all identified with IPv6 by addresses, but they also have an interface ID associated with them as well. We still have our costs listed here in this output. The cost is, identif is representing the value of the interface in regards to OSPF. So this value here was determined by taking that reference bandwidth, which is 100 megabits per second by default and dividing it by the interface bandwidth. So a gig interface has a cost of one. It's gonna be used for the calculation to determine the shortest path to reach particular networks. And uh, while well, fast Ethernet zero also has the same value. So we have a problem here. The default reference bandwidth is basically treating gigabit interfaces and fast Ethernet interfaces the same way. So we'll have to look in how we can modify that a little later on. So that's an issue right now that we'll have to solve later. So, uh, but the cost is listed there of this, these individual interfaces. And then we have our states. The states are ultimately determined and decided based on, first of all, what type of interface is this? Is it an Ethernet interface? If it is, we're going to have to elect a designated router or a backup designated router. So as a result of that, depending on the number of devices that are part of that Ethernet network, then one's gonna be DR, one's gonna be backup designated router, and then somebody's gonna have to be the druther as part of that network. So we can see here that gig one zero is the druther <laughs> uh, in regards to the multi-axis network between R1, R2, and R3. And then fast ethernet zero slash zero is actually the designated router for the link between R3 and R4. Now the P2P option means point to point. And when you have a point to point link, between two routers, serial link running HDLC or PPP, then we don't need to elect a DR or BDR. That's why we see P2P there. Now this last output here is going to identify the number of full neighborships we formed at those interfaces and really the potential number of neighborships we could form at that interface. So the first value is the full neighborships. The second number is the potential we could have formed. Now, most people believe that these numbers should always be the same. And in most cases, they're going to be. For example, if we look at fast ethernet zero size zero, 
I formed one full neighborship and there can only be one. Yeah, it makes sense, right? There's only one other router out fast ethernet zero zero interface. If we look at our three serial interface, it says one, one again. Well, it's a point to point link. There is really only one other router that will ever be out that interface anyways, no matter what. We can't do anything about that. So it's going to be one full neighborship and we could only form one. But the gig one zero interface right now says two, two. But it really depends in this case on the number of routers you end up with. Because R1, R2, and R3 are to connect, connected together via switch. If we had another router in there, then there's four in total. Well, when you're working with a multi-axis network, you only form neighbor adjacencies, full neighbor adjacencies with the designated router. So let's say we have four routers, all right? Four routers connected together here instead of three, four of them. So one's the designated router, one's the backup designated router, which means that what would happen here? Well, this router would form a full neighbor adjacency with the designated router and the backup designated router. So there's two full neighbor adjacencies. But what is it going to do with the fourth router, the other one? Is it going to form a full neighbor adjacency? No, it's not, right? Because we only form full neighbor adjacencies with the designated router and the backup designated router. So as a result of that, we would see two slash three, two slash three. That's what we would see because we formed full two full neighbor adjacencies, but there's a total of three that could potentially be formed, but we're not going to form. We're not going to form another one with that router because that is not how the neighborships are formed in a multi-axis network. You only form full neighbor adjacency with the DR and the BDR. But you notice it's going to say two slash three. And, and the great thing about that is that eventually, if the DR fails, well, then the BDR becomes a DR. And we know that other router exists. We know we could form a full neighborship with it. And if it happens to be the one that's promoted to the backup designated router, then we can form a full neighborship with it at that point in time. So it's essentially telling you, all right, so you formed the two full neighborships, the DR and the BDR, but there's a whole bunch of other routers out there that you know about because of hello packets that are being flooded every 10 seconds throughout that layer two network between these different routers. So very interesting column we see there, the number of neighbors we have, the full neighborships and the potential neighborships that we could have. And you're only going to see these numbers um, different. Right now we see 2-2, two, two, but as I showed you, you could see 2-3 or 2-4 or 2-5, depending on the number of routers. Or, or you might have maybe an access control list in place or a communication issue whereby you see the hello packets, but you can't complete the full neighbor adjacency. And if that's the case, you'd see a discrepancy in that number as well. Now, what other option do we have here for verifying our interfaces? Well, we could type in show IPv6 OSPF interface. We're going to hit, hit enter here now, and we'll see in this output that we're going to get very detailed statistics about each of these interfaces. And this is really great output for troubleshooting. If you ever have a problem forming a neighbor adjacency, you can verify a lot of the parameters in this output. So let's start off at the top of that gigabit Ethernet interface. And you'll see here that the gigabit Ethernet interface is up, up. Well, this is a great sign because we cannot form a neighbor adjacency or share the the global ipv6 unicast route of that interface unless the interface is up up so this confirms that we are participating in the routing process and we are up up therefore we could share that interface information the global ipv6 route with other neighbors or we can even form a neighbor adjacency of this interface there's the link local address of this interface so neighborships are going to be formed with the link local address if we need to form a neighborship. Next top IP addresses are going to be the link local address as well. There's that interface identification number we were talking about in the other output. The area we belong to, the process ID we belong to, the router ID of the device, and then in the network type. So just like with IPv4, OSPF is going to behave differently depending on the network type. So the network type has nothing to do with the fact that it's IPv4 or IPv6. The network type has everything to do with what is happening at layer two. What is happening at layer one? Are we uh, an Ethernet network, multi-axis? Are we a serial link, point-to-point -point running HDLC or PPP? Are we a frame relay link, NBMA, non-broadcast multi-axis? So as a result, I'm going to behave a different way. So you're going to OSPF is designed to behave differently depending on whether it's broadcast, non-broadcast, point-to-point, non-broadcast multi-axis. Uh, sorry, point-to-multi-point, uh, -point, non-broadcast. So a lot of different network types that we have and those are going to dictate how ospf behaves in those different scenarios so do we form a neighbor adjacency 
and elect a DR and BDR, or do we just form a neighbor adjacency and forget about DRs and BDRs? What is our timers going to be? Are they going to be the regular 10 and 40, or are they going to be 30 and 120? So it, it all depends on this network type as to what your starting default values are going to be. Cost is one. So the cost is the reference bandwidth divided by the interface bandwidth. We can see here that we are a druther, so we're not a designated router and we're not the backup designated router. And the election process was done with us having a priority of one. The DR in this case happens to be R1 and the backup designated router happens to be R2. Hello and dead intervals for broadcast is going to be 10 and 40 by default. So broadcast is referring to a multi-axis network like ethernet. And this is a gigabit ethernet connection. So it makes sense there that we're broadcast with the default values of 10 and 40. We'll see when our next hello is due. Can see who we're adjacent with. And if we had authentication set up on the interface, we'd see that in information listed here as well. If we look at our serial output, what I want to show you differently here is that network type. See how it's point to point now? Because it's a serial interface running HDLC. The cost of that is still the reference bandwidth divided by the interface bandwidth. But notice how there's nothing here, nothing here relating to DR or BDR because we don't elect a DR or a BDR when we're on a serial point-to-point -point link running HDLC or PPP as its encapsulation. But notice here, since it's a serial point-to-point -point link running HDLC or PPP, the default hello and dead intervals are 10 and 40. So if you're ever troubleshooting, why might you come to this output while troubleshooting? Well, it's going to allow you to verify whether the interface is participating in the routing process or not. If it's listed here, it is. So you'll be able to see if it's up, up. You'll be able to see the router ID. You'll be able to see the process ID, the area ID, the hello and dead timers, if there's authentication set up. So all of that information can now be verified and compared with the device on the other side. So let's say you're not forming a neighbor adjacency with R3 over the serial link. Well, then you can come here and verify all those really important parameters that have to match or have to be unique in order to form a neighbor adjacency. How do you verify your OSPF v3 neighbor adjacencies? You type in show IPv6 OSPF neighbors. All right, let's look at this output here. We can see that we have our router ID listed and the process ID. So if we had multiple processes of OSPF v3 running, they'd all show up here with the various process ID number representing them. So make sure you're looking at the right process number. That's why I always recommend that even though the process ID doesn't have to match in all these routers in order to form neighbor adjacencies, if you keep it consistent, you know when you're looking at the output of process ID 5 on R1, R2, R3, or R4, it's all part of the same OSPF routing domain. That was your goal. So keeping it consistent helps you out later on when you're troubleshooting or trying to fix problems or make adjustments to your routing domain. So what do we have here? First of all listed is our neighbor IDs. So this is the router ID. Yes, that's right. IPv4 address is the router ID. So with OSPF v3, we do not use IPv6 addresses for the router ID. We still use a 32-bit address, a 32-bit number to represent our router ID. So we can see here the top one is R1, the next one is R2, and the bottom two are for R4. Now when it comes to priority, this is going to be used for our designated router and backup designated router election process. So the priority is set to one by default for IPv4 OSPF, so OSPF v2 and OSPF v3. So priority is one. However, if you are a point-to-point -point link running HDLC or PPP, you can see the priority is going to be zero because you do not elect DR or BDR at all. So this is the priority not locally. This is the priority of the neighbor. So that way there, when we perform the designated router and backup designated router election process, I know what priority my neighbor is using. The state here describes two things for us. Have we formed a full neighbor adjacency with this neighboring device? So has my local device, in this case, R3, formed a full neighbor adjacency? A full neighbor adjacency means that we went from down to init to two-way to xstart, exchange, loading, and then full. We went through the seven-step OSPF process. Full means we are fully synchronized. Fully synchronized. So in this case, we want to fully synchronize with DRs. We want to fully synchronize with BDRs. And we can see we have successfully done that here. 
right here, this is referring to the fact that there is no DR or BDR at all that's going to be elected on that serial 2 slash 1 interface. And the reason why is because, that's right, we don't have DRs or BDRs on point-to-point -point serial links using PPP or HDLC. Dead time. So, oh, before I go that, so this value here is the neighbor's value. So our neighbor at 255.1 is the DR. 113.2 is the BDR. And then we can see 100.4 is the BDR as well for that multi-axis network. Our, hell, our dead timer is by default, it's going to be four times the hello. So the hello packets, depending on the network type, so broadcast and point to point, default dead a hello timer is 10 seconds. And the default dead timer is four times the hello, so 40 seconds by default. In non-broadcast multi-axis networks like Frame Relay, you would see uh, hello timers of 30 and dead timers would be four times that, so you'd have 120 as your dead timer. This is the neighboring device's interface ID, not your local interface ID. It's the neighboring device's interface ID. Always remember that IPv6 uses interface identification numbers to represent the interfaces. So we don't use the IPv6 addresses to represent the interfaces because they're so long, they're so hard to, to memorize or, or, or read or try to figure out. So we have interface IDs instead. This is true for your... Your, your devices, your end stations, your hosts, your laptops, your printers, your PCs that are running IPv6, they're all going to have an interface identification number. So in this case, we can see that our neighbor at 192.168.255.1, right, they're using their interface with a value of 5. So the interface ID of R1 is 5. That's what it ends up being. Uh, that it's using to communicate with us. Same thing with R2. It happens to have an interface ID of 5 as well. Uh, R4, you can see that it has interface IDs of 6 and 3 that it's using to communicate with R3. And the reason why is because when you have IPv6 addresses on an interface, you can have more than one. So you're going to have multiple, you could potentially have multiple global addresses. You could potentially have multiple link local addresses. Oh, sorry, not only one link local address, but multiple global addresses. But the thing about the link local address is that it can be shared amongst all of the interfaces. So I could have one link local address and use it on every single router interface on my device. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, it makes sense that we use an interface ID instead of an address because there's so many addresses we could have on a single individual interface. All right, and lastly, this is our local interface we're going to use to communicate with that neighboring device. So gig 1 slash 0 we use to communicate with both R1 and R2. Serial 2 slash 1 we're going to use to communicate with to R4 over that particular link. And fast Ethernet 0 slash 0 is also used to communicate with R4. How can we identify the different types of OSPF v3 routes that are in our routing table? Well, let's go to R3 and type in show IPv6 route. In this case here, you will see that we have an external route. External routes are going to be represented as either OE1, OE2, ON1, or ON2. And we have an OE2 route here, an external route to the default route. So every single network that is outside of our OSPF routing domain. And you'll see here that it has an administrative distance of 110. The metric for it is one. And we can get there via this link local address. So that's the next top IP address. And who owns that? That is R2's link local address on its gigabit one slash zero interface. So we're gonna use our local gig one slash zero interface to get there. Let's look at this entry here. This is an OSPF route. It is called an intra area route. What that means is it's a route inside of our area. So in this particular case, we can see here that 2001 colon DB8 colon zero colon four double colon slash 64 is in the same area we are in. So R3 is an area border router. So it belongs to two different areas. It belongs to area zero and it belongs to area 51. So if you look at 2001 DB804 double colon slash 64, it, it lives off of R4. So it lives off of R4, it belongs to R4, and it is in area 51. As a result, this interface here is in area 51 as well on R3, both its fast Ethernet 00 and serial interfaces. So as a result of that, we belong to Area 51 as well, R3. So this is a route inside of an area that we belong to. That's what the O stands for, inter. 
sorry, intra area, intra area, route inside of an area that we belong to. You'll see here the administrative distance is also 110 for these types of routes. The metric here is two. How are we going to get there via this next hop link local address? So we use our local fast Ethernet interface to get there. That's what this is referring to right here. So as a result of that, this here is going to be the link local address of our fours fast Ethernet zero slash zero interface. Notice we'll also have our entries here for 12 double colon. But what I want you to really pay attention to here is the fact that we're doing load balancing. So we have routes or a network, a route to 12 double colon slash 64. And it's an O route as well. It's a route inside of an area we belong to. So R3 also belongs to area zero because it's an area border router. So since it belongs to area zero, everything in area zero is also considered in tra area inside an area that I belong to. But in this case, we have two different ways that we can get there. We can get there via the link local address of R1, or we can get there via the link local address of R2. And both of those are reachable out of gig one slash zero on R3. But now I want to take a look at external route. So we'll go over, not external, a route outside of our area, but still within our routing domain. So an inter area route. So we'll type in show IPv6 route in this case. And our focus is going to be on this particular network right here. So we have OI listed, OI. So OI stands for OSPF inter area routes. So inter area routes are routes, networks, inside of our OSPF domain but outside of our area. So O routes intra are routes inside of our area, networks inside of our area that we belong to. But OI inter is for networks outside of our area. So follow along here from R1's perspective, because we are on R1 right now. We know about 2001 DB804 double colon slash 64. It says it's outside of our area. Well, let's look at this. R1's in area zero. Where is four double colon slash 64? It's in area 51. So it's outside of our area. Hence, inter area route, it's called, and it's represented as OI in our routing table. Still has an administrative distance of 110 because it's OSPF V3. There's the metric, the cost to get there. It's three via the next hop address. So link local address of who? R3. So I'm going to get there via R3 in order to get there. And we're going to use our local interface at gigabit one slash zero to get to that next hop IP address. The link state database for OSPF v3 is going to appear different than the OSPF v2 link state database. And the reason why is because there's new LSA types that have been introduced. With OSPF v2, we had type one, type two, type three, type four, type five, type seven. Well, with OSPF v3, we now have type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, type 5, type 7, type 8, type 9. <laughs> That's right. We do. So what does all this mean? Well, let's look at R1's database right now. Show IPv6 OSPF database. So let's just focus on area 0 right now. It's database. We still have at the top here our router LSA, the type 1 LSA. But here's what you need to understand about this router LSA. It's different now. With OSPF v2, the router LSA had a very specific purpose, and that specific purpose was to identify the router and also identify the networks that the router had participating in the routing process and the cost of those particular interfaces. So the Type 1 LSA was the fundamental building block of OSPF v2. It contained absolutely all the information we needed to start building the shortest path first tree. But if we crack one of these open now, if we crack one of these open, so let's just take a look at R1, our local one. And we type in router. Okay. What does it want here specifically now? Router, the link state ID. Didn't like that. Okay, so change it up. Advertising router, that's what I want. Advertising router. All right, here we go. So 
look at the information in here. It's very, very lightweight. I do not see any information about the networks I know about. Doesn't show anything about 2001 colon DBA colon zero colon 12 double colon slash 64 or 2001 colon DBA colon zero colon one, two, three double colon slash 64. It doesn't show any of that. What does it show specifically? It says, I am the router with what? The router ID 192.168.255.1. That's me. That's who I am. Doesn't describe anything at all. No networks at all. So where does the network information come from now? Where does the network information come from? Well, let's look a little deeper down into this database. We'll scroll down more towards the bottom. And what we're going to see here is we're going to see this intra-area prefix link state. Intra-area prefix link state. And what is that? That is what? That is a type 9 LSA. That's right, a type 9 LSA. So let's go ahead and take a look at one of these type 9 LSAs now. So that's our intra-area which is called the prefix and the advertising router is let's look at ourselves okay so now we're into the type 9 lsa here okay we're in the type 9 lsa on r1 and the type 9 lsa says these are the networks i know about these are the networks I know about. So I am 192.168.255.1. And you know about me how? You know about me because of the type 1 LSA, right? I introduced myself using the type 1 LSA. But now I'm going to tell you what I know about. So you can see here through this type 9 LSA that I know about 2001 colon DB8 colon 0 colon 12 double colon. And the prefix length of that is a 64. I also know about 2001 colon DBA colon zero, one, two, three, double colon, 64. So the specific details about the individual links are no longer contained in the type one LSA. They are contained in what? They are contained in the type nine LSA. That's right. So you'll also see here, what's the cost of it? It's a cost of one. All right, so why separate out now, right? OSPF V2, that was all within the type one LSA, but why separate them out now? Why separate them out? They are separated out now to make the routing process and calculations and Dijkstra Shores Path First algorithm run more efficiently. You see, here's what happened to the OSPF V2. If you had one link go up or down on a router, it had to send a type one LSA. But the type 1 LSA contains everything. This is who I am, and this is what I know. Everything. Everything. So that means every router inside that area now had to do what? It had to take this type 1 LSA and say, okay, well, this uh, router is re-advertising itself and all of its information, so now let's perform a Dijkstra shortest path first algorithm on how to reach this router and how to reach all the different networks and what is the best way to get there. So Dijkstra Shorts Path First Algorithm had to work pretty hard for every single little adjustment or change with OSPF V2. But now, but now, here is the great thing about Type 9 LSA when it's separated out from Type 1. You know me already from the Type 1 LSA, so you already know the quickest way to get to me. You already know that. You already know that. So now, now, based on Type 9s, if I now have a change, I send a type nine out and I say, yeah, I'm a 192.168.255.1 and I've had this network added to me. So now, for example, R3 says, well, I already know how to get to you from the type one, right? You, But now you're just telling me you have this extra route or that's gone up or down, one or the other. So now R3 just has to do what? Work on the new information, right? Okay, so you just told me about this route. Cool. I'm going to add it. I'm then going to calculate just that route. I don't have to recalculate everything. I just have to worry about that route. Just add it or remove it and so on and so forth. So improving the behavior of OSPF v3, improving the behavior of Dijkstra Shorts Path First Algorithm, reducing the amount of CPU cycles that have to be used when a small little simple change like a network added or removed to the network occurs. So it's much more efficient use of our OSPF routing now.
So type one for OSPF V2 had everything in it. This is me. This is who I am. This is, this is what is directly connected to me participating in the routing process. This is the cost. Now type one is just, Hey, this is me. What's up? <laughs> and the type two, and the type nine says, all right, you already know about me, but this is everything else that I have as well that I know about. So we don't have to reset those neighborships or recalculate or not reset neighborships, but recalculate how to get to that particular neighbor. We already know how much more efficient. If we go back and take a look at that database, you'll see here that with the database, there's also a type eight LSA. Why do we need a type eight LSA? We need a type eight LSA because we deal with link local addresses. We deal with link local addresses. So if we rip open one of these type eight LSAs, so I POSPF database, uh, let's see here. I think we can go with link on that, if I recall correctly. A lot of new terms. And who's the advertising router in this case? We'll go again with R1, stick with R1. So the advertising router is R1. So what are we describing here? What are these? What are these? What are these? Right, these are being utilized now to describe our what? Our, yeah, they're being used to describe our link local addresses. Our link local addresses. Why? Because our neighbors need to know about us. So since the neighbors need to know about us and we form neighbor adjacencies with link local addresses, this type eight is used to talk only to the devices on that local link. And we say, hey, listen up, listen up. Uh, I have this link local address and I'm 192.168.255.1. This is my link local address on my interface. So if we're going to form a neighbor adjacency and we're going to use next hop IP addresses, this is what we're going to use here because this is what I know on my local link. So it's a way for us to tell the other routers about our local link. But then we also have the ability here as well to tell that neighboring device, oh yeah, by the way, this is the link local address that's associated with the interface that's part of this global network. So if there's no global network on that interface, then the global network's not going to be advertised in the type eight either. You don't need to have global IPv6 addresses on your router interfaces in order for routing to work end to end. You just need a link local address. The global addresses are only needed on your router interfaces if you need some way to communicate with that router remotely from outside of your what? Outside of the local area network that that router belongs to. Because the link local address, you can only communicate locally to it. So what we see often in the real world is that our routers interfaces, our router interfaces only have link local addresses on them. And then we'll have a loopback interface on the router that has a global address that's then advertised through OSPF v3. And we use that for the management purposes as an example. So we don't necessarily need all of our routers to have global addresses on their interfaces. But in my example, I'm showing you so we can see how all that information can be learned and shared. So type eight is really the, the basic building block now where we form our neighbor adjacencies, we share type eight so we can share link local addresses. And if there's a global address on that interface, then we can tell our neighbor about that directly on that with that type eight. Type nine, adding more by, by having that flooded everywhere. So the type nine gets flooded everywhere. Type eight, only between neighbors. Type nine, everywhere in the same area. Type one, everywhere in the same area. Type two, Still the same idea with type two, designated router advertises the type two LSA. So we'll see that now. Type two LSA, the net link state advertised by the designated router. So if you are the designated router, you will generate a type two describing that multi-axis network that you are responsible for. We have a different name for our type three LSAs now. So the type three LSAs are called inter-area prefixes instead of summary LSAs. Thank you for changing the name. I appreciate that. So we can see here that type three LSAs are now listed as inter-area prefix. So routes outside of our area, but still within our routing domain. And it still happens the same way. It's the area border router that advertises them. So we can see R3 advertised 34 double colon 64, 43 double colon 64, and 4 double colon 64 over to R1. And then lastly, let's not forget, if we go way down to the bottom here, we're going to see our type five LSA. So type five LSAs are the same as well. We have a default route here. And that default route is being injected into OSPF v3 by R2, the default information originate command. As a result, that gets shared out to every router in the OSPF. Do you see a problem with this output? I do. Let's see if you can identify it. 
Focus on the interfaces here. We have three interfaces participating in the IPv6 OSPF routing process, so OSPF v3, all part of process ID number five. Gig one zero is in area zero, that's fine. Fast Ethernet zero slash zero is in area 51. Serial two one, area 51, that's fine. The cost of gigabit one slash zero is a one. The cost of serial two slash one, 64. The cost of fast Ethernet zero slash zero is uh, one. I think that's the problem right there. Well, I know that's the problem for me. <laughs> Why is that a problem? Because gigabit Ethernet interfaces are way faster than fast Ethernet interfaces. But OSPF right now is saying that they are equal. They're the exact same. Let's see why that is. Well, if we look at the output of show IPv6 OSPF, pipe to include just ref, reference, we'll see that the reference bandwidth for OSPF v3 is 100 megabits per second by default. So if we analyze that output of show IPv6 OSPF interface again, what do we see from this output? we see that the gig interface, which would be one, was calculated using the reference bandwidth of 100 divided by the interface bandwidth. So we have 100 divided by the interface bandwidth, which is 1,000. That equals 0.1. Well, you can't have 0.1 as a cost, so you round up and you get one. All right, so that's simple. What about the fast ethernet interface? Well, you have 100 megabits per second divided by 100 megabits per second, that equals one. So the calculation is as simple as that. The top value is the reference bandwidth, the bottom value is the interface bandwidth. So we default to a cost of one and a cost of one. Unfortunately, with OSPF, that could, in certain portions of the network, cause suboptimal routing. Whereby if we had a gigabit ethernet link and a fast ethernet link, used to get to the same destination and they were in parallel with each other but going two different ways well then the fast ethernet link is treated like a gig link or vice versa gig is treated like fast ethernet so ospf considers them equal when they're actually not equal and then we get suboptimal routing we might even end up with load balancing because the cost might be the same as a result of that and with load balancing now we aren't really load balancing are we no <laughs> because we're sending some traffic on the fast ethernet link and some traffic on the gigabit ethernet link. And the fast ethernet link is taking a lot longer to get the traffic across the other side. So the result of that is suboptimal routing because half the traffic is taking a much slower path, suboptimal. All right, so with that in mind, how do we solve this problem? Because I really want my gigabit ethernet interfaces to be treated better than my fast ethernet interfaces compared to OSPF. Well, what if I said, let's just modify our reference bandwidth. It's as easy as that. Right, so if we modify the reference bandwidth, he said the reference bandwidth is now 1,000. How does that change our cost? Well, now our cost is one still for gigabit ethernet, but for fast ethernet, it becomes 10, which means our serial link gets a much higher value as well because it would be 1,000 divided by 1.544 megabits per second instead of 100 divided by 1.544 megabits per second. So let's see what happens here on R3. So we'll type in configure terminal. We'll say router IPv6 router OSPF process ID 5. And now we're going to change the reference bandwidth. So it's auto cost reference bandwidth. And the values we can use are 1 to 4.2 million. So we're just going to change it to 1,000 now and see what happens. It, it warns us, hey, hey, hey. You just changed the reference bandwidth, which means that R3 is now making its calculations based on a completely different number than what is being used on the other routers. And the router's like, you know, it's okay with that. I'm okay with that. I'll, I'll still do what I have to do, but I encourage you to change the reference bandwidth on all the other routers as well. So we're all making the exact same decisions using the same numbers. So it's recommended, it's highly recommended that if you change it on one device, you change it on all the devices. Even though it's not mandatory, you should. So that way there, your routers are all performing the same type of calculation. So what I'm going to look at now is the output of show IPv6 OSPF and just the reference bandwidth value. You can see it's now 1,000. And then let's look at our interfaces. So the result of the changes I made are, are, are pretty great. You can see now the cost is 1. 647 and 10. So my my biggest 
concern here was the cost of gig and fast ethernet being the same. Well, we solved that problem by changing the reference bandwidth. So a, a general rule of thumb for the real world is at a minimum, your reference bandwidth should equal the high speed interface in your organization. So if you have a hundred gig ethernet, then your reference bandwidth should be set to a hundred gigs. If you have 40 gigs at a minimum, it should be set to 40 gigs. So that way your 40 gig interfaces get the, 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 the lowest cost and then everybody else gets adjusted based on that. However, you might be sitting with just 10 gig ethernet interfaces right now saying, well, at some point in time, we'll probably get 100 gig ethernet interfaces at some point in time. So why not just set everybody up right now for a reference bandwidth of 100 gig? That would work as well. Some people say, why don't we just set the value then to the highest possible value? So type in configure terminal, IPv6 router, OSPF5, auto cost reference bandwidth. Well, there's a problem with setting it to that value. Right, so even if we look at the output now of the reference bandwidth, which is set to 4.2 million, I want to look at the interface bandwidth here. What is the, 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 the command? Or what is the formula? The formula is reference bandwidth divided by interface bandwidth. So if I take 4.2 million and divided by 1.544 megabits per second, that does not equal 65,535. You see, the problem we run into is that there's a maximum cost for every single interface in OSPF, and that is 65,535. You can't have a cost higher than that. So if you set your reference bandwidth too high, it means all your low-speed interfaces are all going to have now what? A cost of 65,535. So if your reference bandwidth is too low, high-speed interfaces have the same cost. If your reference bandwidth is too high, your slow-speed interfaces all end up with the same cost. And the result is, well, your 56K link, your 64K link, your 128K link, your 256K link, your serial link at 1.544 megabits per second, uh, your fast Ethernet link, your 10 meg Ethernet link, all with a cost of 65,535, you set it to 4.2 million. Wow. Yes. Wow. <laughs> so you got to find the best possible value for your organization. So right now, if my serial link is the slowest speed link in my organization, why not set that as close as I can to 65,535? And then everybody else can adjust themselves based on that. So for example, on R3 right now, if we set our reference bandwidth, so configure terminal, IPv6, router OSPF5. If we set that reference bandwidth to auto cost reference bandwidth, we set that to instead a value that's going to give us as close as possible 65,535 for or 1.544 megabits per second length, serial link, then everybody else will adjust accordingly. And then we could still have 40 gig links and other gig links in our organization without a problem. So how do we figure that out? Well, we know the highest cost is 65,535. So what is 65,535 times, times the speed of serial? 1.544 megabits per second. Well, that would be about 101,000 and some change. So I'm just going to go with 100,000 here. So based on that value now, if we look at our reference bandwidth, it's 100,000. If you look at our interface cost, you'll see that the cost of that serial interface is 64,766. So that's almost 65,535. We could have set it to 101. That would even get it closer. But look at the gig interface now. It's a cost of 100 which means a 10 gig interface would have a cost of 10 and a 100 gig interface would have a cost of one. So by setting that reference bandwidth to 100,000 here, I'm able to support from 100 gig interface all the way down to a 1.544 megabit interface when it comes to cost. So that's pretty much the range there that we have. So over time, you're gonna get rid of your slower speed links and you're gonna replace everything with higher speed links. So you might have to adjust your cost at that point in time. But right now I have the room to grow up to 100 gigabit links while still maintaining that serial link within my organization. Let's identify how our routers determine the metric, the cost of a particular given path. So let's go to R1 right now. We're going to type in show IPv6 route. And we'll see in this case that our network 
of 2001 colon DB8 colon zero colon four double colon slash 64 has a value of 1200 associated with it as the cost, the metric. So how is that determined? Well, every single interface is going to have a metric associated with it, a cost value assigned to it. So with that in mind, R4 has a cost value assigned to gig one slash zero. It then tells R3 about that network and the cost of it. R3 then analyzes, well, what is the best way to get there over the fast ethernet link or the serial ethernet link? Once it determines that it's the fast ethernet link, then it knows that the total cost is the fast ethernet link plus the gigabit ethernet link. Then R3 takes that information and injects it into area zero using a type three LSA. So the type three LSA says, hey, I'm R3 and I know how to get to 2001 colon DBA colon zero colon four double colon slash 64. And the total cost to get there is whatever it happens to be. So then R1 looks at that type three information and says, all right, so I know that R3 can get there with a cost of whatever it happens to be. And my cost to get to R3 is whatever it happens to be. Add the two together. Now I have my grand total of 1200. So let's follow the path here. Let's see what's really happening here with R4. So if we look at R4 here, configure terminal, sorry, no, no. show IPv6 OSPF interface brief. We'll see here that the gigabit ethernet interface has a cost of 100, has a cost of 100. So when R4 advertises this particular network of 2001 colon DB8 colon four, uh, zero colon four double colon slash 64, it says the cost is 100 that is associated with that. So we can see that information in our link state database. So if we type in show IPv6 OSPF database, and then I want to take a look at the type nine LSAs here from our four. So the type nine from our four, that's the intra area prefix link states. And let's make sure that's the right router ID. It is. So, and we want to specifically look now at our in our prefix one. So prefix. And the advertising router I want to look at is this particular router here. So you'll see. One nine two one six eight one hundred dot four. There we go. So we can see in this particular case, I'm R four, and I have two prefixes. I have four double colon, and in this particular case, four double colon is with a metric of one hundred. So going back to our previous command, we saw we can see it's one hundred. So. As that gets advertised over to R3. So if we go over to R3, we look at the same output on R3. Look at the same output. So we'll grab this information here. We'll go over to R3 and say, hey, I want to look at that information I received. So when you look at this information now, you'll see that for double colon definitely has a cost of 100 associated with it. So we know about that. So now R3 has to decide, well, how do I get to R4? What's what's going to be the quickest way to get there? Well, from R3's perspective, if we just look at the output of show IPv6 OSPF interface brief, we'll see in this output that if we take our fast Ethernet link, there's a cost of 1,000. And if we take the serial link, it has a cost of 64,766. So if I choose a fast Ethernet link, we have a value of 1,000 plus 100. Because gig one's zero has a value of 100 on R4, has a value of 100 on R4. So we have 1,000 plus 100 is 1,100. If we choose to take the serial link at 64,766 plus 100, which is 64,866. So we know that using a fast Ethernet link is going to be much quicker. So if you look at our data, our routing table, show IPv6 route, we'll see that to get to that network, we're choosing the value of 1,100. So that is the gigabit ethernet interface of R4 with a value of 100 plus our fast ethernet interface of 1000, that's 1100. So we have that cost there. So now what we need to do is we need to tell area zero about that. And we're gonna use our type three LSAs to do that. So if we look at our show IPv6 OSPF database, I wanna look specifically at the inter area prefix LSAs that I am generating here. You'll notice that we're generating the four double colon slash 64, and we're going to be sending that into area zero. 
So what we're going to do now is we are going to look at the show IPv6 OSPF database output for inter-area routes. Inter-area routes. And we're going to look specifically at prefix. And then what is that uh, prefix advertising router? Myself. All right. So in this case, we can see here that we are advertising. 2001 colon dba colon zero colon four double colon slash 64 with a total metric of 1100 so that's what we're advertising into area zero so now r1 gets that type 3 lsa so let's go back up here and copy this command i'm going to go to r1 and on r1 i'm going to type in that command and we'll see here that i'm learning about four double colon from R3 with a 64 subnet mask and it's 1100. Now the question is, is how do I get to R3? Well, I know I get to R3 out gigabit one slash zero, out gigabit one slash zero. So show IPv6 OSPF interface brief. And what is the value of gigabit one slash zero? It's 100. So we have now 1100 plus 100 equals 1200. So let's look at R1's routing table now. And there is R1200. So it's simply a matter of every single router identifying that particular network, the costs associated with it, and then running Dijkstra's algorithm to figure out what is the shortest and quickest way to get there based on these cost values. And then take those LSAs and flood them where they need to be flooded. So within an area, for example, area 51, if we had more routers, then what would happen in area 51 with all the other routers is those type nano LSAs would be flooded to every single router in area 51. And every router would ultimately determine based on the type one LSA, the type nine LSA and the type eight LSA essentially, okay, what is the quickest way to get to these different networks that are being advertised in area 51? But as you can see with R3 now, when R3 gets that information, it has to send it in area zero. It just takes that information that it came up with, the 1100, and says, all right, I'm just throwing that as a type 3 LSA into area zero. And then the routers in area zero calculate how far it is to get to R3, which would be based on what? Your type 1 LSAs coupled with your type 9s or your type 8s. And... As a result of that, now R1 knows, okay, to get to R3, it's 100 in total. And then as a result, it's giving me a value of 1100. So 1100 plus my 100 is 1200. The OSPF V3 router ID has to be unique. So every router in your OSPF V3 routing domain is going to have a very unique router ID to represent itself. And as LSAs are being flooded throughout the OSPF domain, these LSAs are going to be tagged with the particular router ID so every router knows where it came from. So when we look at the output of SHA-IPv6 protocols, we can see that in this case, R3 has a router ID of 192.168.255.3. But how was that determined? Because this can be confusing. What does that look like? What does that smell like? What does that taste like? What does it feel like? Well, an IPv4 address. But we're dealing with IPv6 OSPF here, OSPF v3. Isn't that all about IPv6 addresses? Not about IPv4? Yeah. But the router ID still looks like, feels like, tastes like, smells like, acts like an IPv4 address for OSPF v3. So how is it determined? Well, first and foremost, the router, when you enable the routing process on it, says, is there a router ID manually defined by the administrator? And if there is, it's going to use it. So that trumps absolutely everything. But let's say now there is none. What is the router going to do? The router is going to look at its interfaces that have IPv4 addresses assigned to it. So first and foremost, it says show IP interface brief, not IPv6, but show IP interface brief. And it says, do I have any loopback interfaces right now? If I have a loopback interface or multiple loopback interfaces, Use the highest IPv4 address on the loopback interfaces. However, only use loopback interfaces that are up, up. Do they have to be participating in the routing process? No, not at all. 
They don't have to be those interfaces. So the interface just has to be up, up, and it has to have the highest IPv4 address. So if there's no router ID command, it looks at the IPv4 addresses on loopback interfaces first and would use the highest one. But in this case, we don't have loopback interfaces, do we? No. So we go with the physical interfaces now. So the physical interfaces, the router says, which one has the highest IPv4 address? But it's only going to look at the ones that are up, up. So if the interface is not up, up, it cannot be used that router ID or that address as a router ID. So in this case, the interfaces are all up, up that we have IPv4 addresses on. So which one's the highest one? 192.168.255.3 is the highest one. And that becomes our router ID. So what is that process again? It's a three-step process. Check to see if there's one manually set. If there is, use it. If not, look at loopback interfaces, only the up-up loopback interfaces, and whichever loopback interface has the highest IP address, use that. If there are no loopback interfaces, then look at the physical interfaces, only those that are up-up with IPv4 addresses, and whoever has the highest IPv4 address, use it. So higher is better, and loopback will win, unless the router ID command is used, and in that case, the router ID command wins. So if you ever want to manually set your router ID, you go to the global configuration mode, IPv6 router OSPF, process ID 5 in this case, and our router ID is going to be, I'm going to say 000.5. No, I actually want it to be 3, not 5, 3. This is router 3. But notice it won't take effect right away because we have neighborships, we've shared information, we've exchanged LSAs using our old router ID. So I need to clear the IPv6 OSPF process in order to, for this to take effect. So I'm gonna do now, and I'm gonna say yes to that, and our neighborships will be broken, and then we'll reform our neighbor adjacencies using the new router ID, and now we'll share the information using that new router ID. So if we go over to R1 and we type in show IPv6 OSPF neighbor, we'll see here in this output that we have a neighborship now 0003, instead of 192.168, 192.168.255.3. You might be saying, wait, it's still there. It is. We got to wait for our dead timer to expire. As you can see, the dead timer is now 9, 6, 5, 4. And you'll see a syslog message appear here saying neighborship's gone down. So everything that we learned originally from 192.168.255.3 has now been completely removed from our OSPF database. And whatever 0003 has told us is what is going to be used from now on going forward, which happens to be the same device. It happens to be the same device, but we had to wait for that dead timer to expire to clear all the old information from 192.168.255.3, which is originally R3. So I recommend that you manually set your router ID in the real world. Why? Because it's stable. That's right. It's not going to change now unless somebody manually changes it on you. And if somebody manually changes it on you, you better find out why. And you better be upset about it because nobody should be manually changing your router IDs unless it was decided based on your organizational requirements to do so, all right? So as a result of that, if you're using loopback interfaces, it's potential that a new loopback interface could be added at any time with a higher IP address. And at some point in time, if the router's ever reloaded or the OSPF VT process is restarted, well, then that higher IP address on that new loopback interface ends up being the router ID. Well, that now no longer coincides with the documentation you have. So you either update your documentation or you manually set your router IDs to match your documentation. What about with the physical interfaces? Same thing with the physical interfaces. They go up, they go down, they flap, they do this, do they do, they do that. Routers can be rebooted. Again, unstable. So if you're using the physical interfaces as router IDs, well, they could potentially change. So using loopback interfaces or physical interfaces, the router ID could potentially change. There is the chance. Do you want to take that chance? I don't want to take the chance. So I'm a big fan of manually setting the router ID with the router ID command. And I would recommend you do the same thing in the real world. It should just be part of your OSPF process. When you are building OSPF v3, manually set the router ID. So show IPv6 protocols now says our router ID is 0003.